Good morning. Good morning. You know, if you had a regular preacher here, and it was the same one over and over each week, he, normally he'd stand up here and say something like, we'd like to welcome the visitors. But since I'm a visitor, I guess I'm going to start out with saying I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Scott. I'm a Manhattan Christian College student. I've been there. I will graduate in December, so I'm almost done. Then we're moving down to Abilene, Christ Abilene Texas and going to, I'm going to attend Abilene Christian for my master's program. I have a beautiful wife and two kids in the back, and uh, I brought, the, we're from St. Joseph, Missouri originally, so actually Perry is like the halfway point. So I brought my grandparent, uh, grandpa down, along with my mom and dad and my in-laws. So yeah, we're going to go celebrate a six-year-old birthday after we get done here. So, well, that's a little bit about me. Your church is absolutely beautiful. I, I came in and I saw the windows and I think they look absolutely wonderful. So I just wanted to let you know that. Uh, this morning... If I was to take a quick poll of everybody out here about what you think about on a daily basis, I would guess most of you would say that you think about the present more than the past. Uh, we spend most of our time in the present. When we go to work, we're thinking of things in the present. When we're with our families, we're thinking about things in the present primarily. When we're watching TV and reading our emails or looking at Facebook, we're in the present. When we're watching the news and everything going on in the world, it's everything that's happening right now. But what happens when our present runs into a problem? We have to rely on our past to guide us. My grandfather, he's a dairy farmer. He's been one his whole life. If a cow is having a hard time calving, he relies on his past experiences and what others have taught him to get that cow through that situation. My wife's a RN, a registered nurse, and she's great at her job, even if she doesn't think so herself. But she is absolutely wonderful at her job, and that's because of her education. She's had her past work experiences and what others have taught her uh, how to handle certain situations. <coughs> and I think the past is what we often use to help us succeed in the present and in the future. But when it comes to our spirituality, a lot of times we forget that. Uh, throughout the history of Christianity, there's been almost 2,000 years of Christian history. There's been a lot of people that have shaped Christianity and a lot of great men and women of faith that we can learn from. But often, if they're not mentioned in the books of Matthew through Revelation, we don't talk about them inside church. And I think that's one of the things that we need to look at, is look at our past, look at our history, and learn from those men and women that have come before us. And so we kind of do that with the Bible as well, though. We live in the New Covenant. And so the majority of the time, I think we focus on the New Testament, but there's so many things we can learn from the Old Testament. If you have something new, that means there was something old. If you have something new, it means something came from the old. And so that's kind of what I'm wanting to do today. We're going to look a little bit at his, uh, Christian history, as well as perhaps the most famous Old Testament passage there is. Uh, to begin, I'd like to tell you a story about a man. He was born in February of 1837, so this is right around Civil War time, about 10, 20 years before the Civil War began. And he was born in Northfield, Massachusetts, and his parents called him Dwight. Well, the life for Dwight wasn't always easy. When he was four years old, his dad died, leaving his mom with nine children, most of them under the age of 10. And so what happened was, things wasn't easy. They weren't a rich family. They didn't have much money. And so what Dwight did, his, his, him and his siblings, when they came of age, mom sent them out during the summers to work, to help make a living, help su supply food and clothing for themselves and the family. And when I say come of age, it's not 16 like we think of today, or 18 or 21. We're talking about eight years old kids were going out in the summer to help make money for the family to survive. 
But even doing that, things weren't always good. And in fact, things got so bad, Dwight's mother was so behind, creditors came and took nearly everything from their house. They left the house and they left the beds, and that's about it. It was so bad that this was wintertime, and the creditors even took the firewood that was used to heat the house. Things weren't looking well for Dwight, but you know, there was a preacher. His name was Oliver. And he came and he took care of the family. He came and would bring food and clothing and money. And even though he was an elderly man, he took the time and if he could, he helped cut firewood to keep the family warm. Well, fast forward a few years and he, Dwight, he turns 17. And he petitions his mom, Mom, let me move to Boston and work with my uncle. Let me sell shoes for my uncle in Boston. Well, mom says the only way you're going to do it is if your uncle agrees that you're going to go to Sunday school every, more, every Sunday and church services every Sunday. But you see, Dwight still wasn't one to the Lord, but he saw what Pastor Oliver had done, and it made an impact on his life. But he agrees to this, and the uncle agrees to it as well. So he moves down to Boston, and every single Sunday, there he is going to Sunday school, going to church services. But he still wasn't really caring about what he was listening to. Oftentimes, he slept during church service. I look around, luckily no one is asleep yet, so we're doing good. But he slept through church services. He didn't care what was going on. He'd worked six long days of work at selling boots and making boots. He just was tired. He just wanted to sleep. But you know, there was a man, his Sunday school teacher, Mr. Kimball. He was walking by the shoe store one day and something made him stop. He didn't know what it was, but he just knew he had to go talk to Dwight. So he turned around and he goes into the shoe store and he goes to the back room where his Dwight's working and he says, Dwight, we need to talk. And now in truth, history doesn't tell us what this conversation was about, what was actually said. But it was at that moment Dwight was one to the Lord. His heart was pricked. He was convinced he needed God to fulfill a life. And so what am I trying to do with this story, and how does it apply today? What scripture in the Old Testament could I possibly be trying to link to this? Well, this passage is a passage that in Jewish history was read twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. And so every Jew would know this entire passage by heart because they went over it over and over again. I do a lot of memory work, and we work with uh, my six-year-old. She can actually do most of the Bible, Genesis through, I, I think we're on 2 Thessalonians. She can get the whole thing. But we don't even do that twice a day. So, I mean, this is something they would really know. And so it's called the Great Shema, and it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I'd like to read it for you. Deuteronomy chapter 6, it's verses 4 through 9. I read out of the English Standard Version, so yours might vary a little, but the point is all the same. Starting in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. As I read that, probably the one part that really stuck out to you was the part that I, Jesus actually said. He was confronted by scribe, uh, scribe and, he's, and the scribe says, Teacher, what's the most important commandment? What's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. But rarely do we go back into the Old Testament and read the entire thing because Jesus referenced this passage and everybody he was talking to wouldn't have stopped there. They would have known the whole passage is what Jesus was referencing. But we don't get that because we're not Jewish. We don't do this passage twice a day. 
But that's what his audience would have heard. And I'd like to go back and we're just going to read verse 7. I'm just going to read the beginning of it. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Uh, if you have the NIV, it says you will impress them on your children. And so what this means is something very repetitive over and over and over again that we are supposed to be talking about God to our children and teaching them God's commands. And as I read this, I thought, you know, this isn't just for parents. A lot of times we think that's the parents' job, but it's a lot more people than that. It's grandparents, it's aunts, it's uncles, it's Sunday school teachers, it's neighbors. It's for all of us. And now let's think back to what I said about Dwight. Preacher Oliver, he didn't win Dwight to the Lord, but guess what? He imprinted God's love on him. He showed Dwight what God's love was all about by his actions and by his deeds. And then Dwight moved to Boston, and it was <coughs> Mr. Kimball that imprinted a little bit more onto Dwight before Dwight actually came to Christ. We must remember, we never know what it's going to take to bring someone to the Lord, and we don't even know who, what they're going to do with it. Some people will come to the Lord, and they'll run with it, and they'll do wonderful things, and some, you know, they might start out strong and then teeter off a little bit. We never know what's going to happen. But we also never know who God is going to use for the next revival. You see, Dwight moved a few years later from Boston to Chicago, and he continued to sell shoes. Now, if God can use a shoe salesman, he can use anybody. But he's, Dwight moves to Chicago, and he ends up throughout his entire life preaching to over 100 million people. You see, Dwight, his name's Dwight L. Moody. A lot of people call him D.L. Moody. You might have heard of the Moody Institute or the Moody Bible in, yeah, the Moody Bible Institute. Those are all things that he actually started. But he preached to over 100 million people. And that was before Twitter. It was before Facebook or YouTube. It was before email. It was before computers and phones. It was even before public address systems. But he was able to do all that. D.L. Moody is considered to be a man that actually brought a revival back to Europe, brought God back to Europe. You see, Europe was losing their spirituality, and Moody went over there and spent, I think, seven years over in Europe and caused a great revival in Europe. And then he came back, and he basically did the same thing here in America. You never know who you will inspire and what that person will actually do. Preacher Oliver thought he was just helping out a poor family. Mr. Kimball was worried about the soul of a 17-year-old. Neither was like, we're going to work on this man and he's going to go spread the word to millions and millions of people. But how did D.L. Moody do this? How did he end up spreading the word to all these people and touching all these lives? He started off by focusing on the youth. In Chicago, he became a pillar of the YMCA when it was the Young Man's Christian Association. He ended up opening a seminary for young women so they could go get educated and learn about God. He did it by renting out four pews in a church and filling them each and every week with youth. Now, I said renting out, and I didn't understand what I meant when I originally was looking this up. I'm like, rent out pews? What does that mean? Back in this day, the wealthy would actually purchase their pews so they could sit in the premium spots and not have to be bothered by the riffraff of the other congregation. And here you have D.L. Moody buying four pews and putting most likely what they would consider riffraff right in there with them. And that's what he did each and every week. He ended up taking a saloon, and on Sundays he turned it into a Sunday school. This Sunday school became so popular, a thousand youths were there each and every time they met. A thousand kids going to Sunday school in one location. That's awesome. 
This Sunday school was so popular, President Lincoln himself stopped by one time just to see how it was operating. D.L. Moody certainly touched many, many lives. But guess what? It's hard for you to touch lives. It's hard for you to show people God's love and God's commands if we don't know them ourselves. If you think back to the great Shema, the passage I read, that's really what the majority of the passage is about, is getting ourselves right. I, I have selected just a few parts out of it, and I'm just going to read it. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And when you write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Almost this entire passage deals with living a godly life and always remembering God and his commandments in everything that we do. We can't compartmentalize our spirituality. It's who we are, and we should be telling everybody about it. If the writer here in Deuteronomy is telling his audience to write it on city gates and write it on your doorpost, he's doing it so the whole world can see, hey, a God-fearing man lives here. We should be doing the same thing, and just to paraphrase paraphrase James Brown just a little bit and take it way out of context, but James Brown might say something like, we should say it loud and we should say it proud. We are Christian. That's what we need to be doing. You see, you don't need to be a professional preacher to learn God's word, to live a godly life, or to love God with all your heart, soul, and might. And you don't need to be a professional preacher to teach other people about God. You just have to believe and study. You see, D.L. Moody, he was never a trained theologian. He's considered one of the greatest lay ministers ever. He never went to a seminary. He never went to Bible school. In fact, he has about a sixth grade education. He got through the fifth grade, and he went through the sixth grade, but he didn't really do anything in the sixth grade. He was just kind of there. He said, I'm present for class. So he had almost a sixth grade education, but he was at, God was able to use him to do all these wonderful things. But here's why. He might not have had the formal education, but he understood he needed to learn about God, and he studied God's word daily, and he sought out people to help him learn God's word. He needed someone to help show him the great themes of the Bible and what was going on. But, you know, we can do the same thing here. We have commentaries. We have great books. We have Bible studies. We have preachers, online classes. We have group Bible studies. All those things we can use as resources to help us learn God's Word without having a formal education. You know, just a, one more story about Moody. He uh, invited this well-known theologian to teach. And so the whole congregation sitting out there, probably just about like you, and Mo Moody introduces this great theologian. And Moody walks around in the front as soon as he's done and sits in the very first pew, and he's looking up in the pulpit right at the guy, and he has a pen and a piece of paper. The theologian would talk, and Moody would write. He'd talk some more, and Moody would write some more. He was just loving it. Well, pretty soon, the theologian spoke, and he heard D.L. Moody go, Oh, there goes a sermon. And the theologian stopped. Moody's well known at this time. Everyone knows him. And he goes, Is everything okay, Dwight? Dwight goes, Yeah, but I got to throw away a sermon. It was built on a misinterpretation, but now I have seen how it should really be interpreted. And the theologian just smiled at him, looked up at the congregation, and moved on, and he continued to speak. Later on in the sermon, he spoke, and Moody groans again, Oh, there goes another one! <laughs> and this went throughout the whole time, and every time the theologian just smiled at him and continued on. You see, Dwight humbled himself. He knew he wouldn't always get it right. He humbled himself and realized his mistakes. And we need to do that too. A lot of times 
we get into a thing where it's like, well, I know this is the right way to interpret it. I've, done, I've interpreted this scripture the same way my whole life. Well, guess what? Maybe you're wrong. There's a lot of great commentaries out there we need to continue to look and study, but when we find something that we have messed up on, we need to admit it and move on. You see, because that's learning from our past, and we're moving on to a bright future. As I get ready to close today, I just want to tell you a quote from D.L. Moody. He actually was talking to a man, and he said, You know, I have got only one talent. I have no education, but I love the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want to do something for him. Let us pray. Our Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day, and thank you for allowing us to come together and learn about your word and let it, letting us learn about Dwight Moody and how he used the gospel and how he transformed the world. Dear Lord, let us take something from this lesson and apply it to our daily lives. Let us go out and find the youth. Find them where they were, because that's what he did. He didn't wait for them to come into a church. He went and found them and brought them to the Lord. Dear Lord, be with us and let us all say, I love the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want to do something for him, Lord. Whatever it is you have for us that we need to do, Lord, let it be on our hearts and give us the strength and the courage to go do it for you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.